Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 73 of the podcast. It's the 24th of May, 2017, as I record this intro. And it's Q&A time again. Here we are, the last Thursday of May, and Ann Oman and Anna Brown join me to answer your questions. This month, we dive into the deeper roots we sometimes see underneath people's questions, what it really means to release control, the idea of boredom, unschooling in the early years, and grumpy moments. It was a great set of questions this month, and I hope you enjoy diving in alongside us. As a personal update, I've received some wonderful feedback this week about last week's episode with Sophie Christoffi on the website, on Facebook, and by email. I love getting a glimpse of your aha moments, the insights and connections that you guys are making as you listen. It's beautiful, and it's just what I had in mind when I began the podcast. I wanted to share information and insights from people on this unschooling journey. Actually, I liked when Sandra called it a practice the other week. That struck a chord with me. So having conversations with people who are practicing unschooling. And then I like sharing those conversations without expectations. Because after that, it's about how listeners engage with them. My work is done, but it's definitely great to see what connections people make, what insights spark aha moments of clarity for others. You guys rock how you take this and run with it. And thanks so much to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon. And a big welcome to five new patrons this week. Emma Symes, Elizabeth, Jana Hilton, Monica Pilage, and Mary Ann Wettler. Thank you so much. You know, sometimes words don't seem to be enough, but I really do appreciate your support. You guys inspire me to keep putting my very best efforts into the show. And I love that you're helping me share unschooling information with anyone who wants to explore this wonderful lifestyle with their family. If you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week, I want to share a quote from the episode, something Anne said. The thing about thinking unschooling is about releasing parental controls is this. I feel there is no release at all unless the parent believes they have the power to release control. I wanted to pull this out because I think it's so important. Because it's not the question that you might think at first. On the surface, it's pretty easy to answer. Of course, I can release control by not controlling my child. But it's more than that. It's not just about releasing your controlling actions. It's about releasing your need for the result of that control. The question is not so much about your actions, but about your thoughts. Can you release your attachment to a specific outcome? It's not very helpful to stop acting controlling if you still have a particular place you expect your child to end up. Releasing control only works well if alongside it, we release our expectations. So even if you release controlling language, expectations can still come through loud and clear in our body language, in our open-ended suggestions, in our reactions, even in our pointed looks. Words aren't our only tools of communication. And if we want our children to know that they are truly free to choose, we need to express that through all modes of communication and connection with them, or else we're just sending them confusing and conflicting messages, and that doesn't help. We can't just say it. We need to believe it. We need to fully release the need to control expectations and all. And now, on to your questions. Welcome to another Q&A episode. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and I am so happy to be joined again by Ann Oman and Anna Brown. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello, hello. hello. Uh, would you like to get us started, Ann? 
Why, certainly. Yay. We have our first question today from Kelly. And she writes, we have been unschooling for just over two years with one year of project-based homeschooling before that. My kids were seven and 10 when they left school. There were no big issues. We wanted to give them the opportunity to learn with freedom and choice. Unschooling has been great for our family and a huge source of personal growth for me as I de-school and lift the layers of my beliefs and assumptions. It has been so much more inner work than I ever fathomed it to be, but so, so worth it. Please do help me peel back the last layers that I'm harboring around food and activity. We definitely controlled our kids' food pre-unschooling and ate organic, raised a lot of our own food, rationed treats and sweets, etc. As we lifted the controls on food, my son, my younger child, really dove into all the things we never allowed him before. Soda, candy, commercial brands of processed snacks, etc. It's been two years and it really hasn't let up. I have been breathing and yesing and buying. I know I still hold tension inside, sometimes less so than others, but I bite my tongue and ask open questions like, do you like, do you feel like salty or sweet food, hot or cold? And other questions to help him tune into himself when he asks for food. Sometimes I try and give a little more nutritional information, but he is very sensitive to anything that sounds like it might be a lecture, and I do not want to make him feel bad or lecture to. So I have kept this to a minimum as he doesn't ask for the information and tells me he's done listening after I offer some unsolicited info. He loves to come gro- to the grocery store with me and pick out his snacks, cupcakes, chocolate bars, juices, popsicles, and other candy, etc. He also picks out fruit he likes, meat and seafood and other things. Here's the thing. He has gained a lot of weight in the last two years. He stays up very late into the wee hours gaming. I wake up to cartons of ice cream and multiple popsicle wrappers or candy bar wrappers on the coffee table. While I do think some could be attributed to preteen weight gain, I cannot ignore the hours of sitting and abundance of sweet food and desserts as contributors as well. I do not care about him getting a little chubby, except the weight has made it more difficult for him to be physically active. He gets tired easily. He avoids doing certain activities because it's hard for him. He loves mountain biking. Next to gaming, it's his passion with his dad. This summer, he has chosen to go to a week-long camp at his favorite mountain. He's excited, and we are excited for him. He is not in shape for it. He does a couple of activities during the week at the Y and a martial arts class. These three to four hours of activity do not balance out the hours of sitting and gaming the rest of the week, especially when he sleeps until 1 to 2 p.m. He gets winded going up the stairs or doing a rousing play sword fighting match with me. As a younger brother with just one older sister who does not want to play with him, he doesn't have a regular active playmate. We get together with friends, but it's only a couple of times a month. I do as much as he wants with him. But when he gets up at 2 p.m., he wants to get right to his games, and it feels like our time together is short by the time I am ready for bed, around 10 or 11. I want him to have a great time at camp. We have, a ca- we have had casual conversations about getting ready for camp. We live in snow country, so it is not nice out yet, but hopefully within a month or so, spring will be here. I am hoping with a better weather, we'll get out more naturally on our trampoline building bike jumps in the yard. I'd love your advice on how I can best support my son to, one, maybe consider how eating affects our bodies and our ability to engage in physical activities we enjoy, and two, that conditioning will help him to take on big taxing activities like biking for five days straight. How can I do this without lecturing or scaring him off? Thanks so much. I never miss the podcast. I listen every week. Okay. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for writing and for your question. I so appreciate you reaching out to help your son. Um, One of the things I love so much about doing this podcast with Pam and Anna is that often um, people ask a question, and yet from the other information they offer, we tend to be able to see beyond what they think their question is. And that's the reason I believe that people get stuck in one area and feel like they can't see their way past a certain challenge because they're just looking at this one spot on their path while Pam and Anna and I are listening and can often see things going on over here and maybe something a little over here. And what we try to do with our um, answers is try to hold the lantern on those other parts of the path to help people see what's going on in the bigger picture. And what often happens is that by illuminating these other things and working on those, Uh, The very thing that was the original concern or challenge may have diminished greatly or no longer exist at all. 
Anyway, I believe that might be what's happening here, Kelly. And what I'd like to do is illuminate other areas that you may not be seeing because of your focus on your son's weight. And these are just places for you to check in on with yourself to see if you can be stretching a bit more um, in these areas. So first, I'd like to shine my lantern right over here on your amazing son and how he shines. From what you've shared with us, I can see so many ways in which he shines, but I'm sure there are so many more. I want to make sure you are seeing his shine. Are you nurturing and encouraging all of the ways in which he shines? His love of sweets is one of the things that he loves, and yet it's just a very small part of who he is. There's so much more to him uh, that needs love and attention and acceptance and celebration, and even the love of sweets is included in that. Uh, it's important to make sure that he knows for sure that you radically accept and celebrate who he is as he is right now. And celebrating our children for being exactly who they are um, is exactly how they shine, and that includes celebrating the things that they love. So second, I'd love to shine my lantern over here on another part of who he is that you mentioned, because this is also how he shines, in his sensitivity. Uh, the world needs sensitive souls like his, and I love how you said that he is sensitive to your lectures or anything. Um, that part of him deserves to be honored and celebrated as well. If you haven't read the book, The Highly Sensitive Child, you might want to do so because uh, that shows us how we can celebrate our sensitive children also. And the thing about him being sensitive is this. Uh, you can be sure that he is picking up on everything you're feeling, not just when you're standing in front of him, giving him nutritional information, um, but everything you're, that you're feeling. And uh, the, a sensitive child feels the weight of a parent's disapproval hugely. Not only do they feel it, but they take it upon themselves and they own it themselves. And it's possible that your son is already feeling bad about himself, and he's also taking on your feelings, too. So while you're saying yes to him and buying to him buying and eating anything he wants, he very well could be feeling that you're, you know, biting your tongue and uh, gritting your teeth while you're saying yes. And that's coming across as judgment and disapproval. And you also it sounds like are holding expectations for him because you want him to make choices that you approve of. So that's another thing that a uh, child is sensitive to, any expectations. So as the parent of a sensitive child, I feel like there's more inner work uh, that we need to do to get in a genuine and authentic space of feeling good and feeling joy when you're interacting with or even when you're just around your child because they are so sensitive to any negative feelings and we don't want to hand them any more weight. So how do you do that? Well, you focus on his shine, of course. You go back to that first thing we illuminated with our lantern. How does your boy shine? And how does his beingness light up your world? These things are your focus. There's no better way to celebrate your child for being exactly who he is than to jump into that which he loves right with him, nurturing and encouraging and validating the joy he's receiving from these things that he loves. You know, and that's even the sweets um, from the beginning. It could have been a, a validation that uh, he hasn't had them before and how he's enjoying them now. Um, that's where that, you know, you're gritting your teeth and saying yes thing comes into play as opposed to radically validating uh, something that he is enjoying. But um, my highly sensitive son is now 27 and he would own the weight of the world, especially when he was the age that your son is. And yes, he would own any negative weight that I handed to him from myself. I actually remember the exact time when I realized that I needed to get my energy in a place of genuine joy and happiness when I was around him. My younger son has always been more of a happy, go-of-the-flow kind of kid. And so when Sam would come to me, I'd be excited to hear what he wanted to share with me. And I realized that I lit up when he came into the room. And I realized that when Jacob would come to me, I would often be thinking, 
oh no, what's the matter now? And I was shocked when I realized that, but also so glad because I knew I could do something about it from that moment on. And right then I decided that every time my children came to me, I would be or get in a place where my eyes would light up with gladness simply for seeing them. And I still hold on to that all these years later. In fact, Jacob worked for me at the library for a couple of years until recently. And when he would walk in the door, when it was time for me to go home and he was going to work, sometimes I would be so into my work that I barely lifted my head to greet him. And then one day I did remember that I wanted to make sure he knew I was so happy to see him. And so from then on, I made sure when it was time for him to work at the library, I'd watch the clock and I would mindfully get in a place to be ready to greet him and to appreciate his amazing shine when he brought that in the door. And what's so beautiful is that our relationship and interactions that flow that followed after those initial moments of me lighting up when I saw him uh, flowed all the more sweetly for my having done the mindful preparation of shifting to really see, honor, and celebrate my son. Um, so have you noticed that I've been referring to the heaviness of the feelings that you're holding on to about your son as weight? And I talk about this uh, in the Childhood Redefined Summit a lot. I think this is a great tool for you, a good concept for you to visualize in order to move forward. If every time you had a feeling of disapproval or judgment, or any time you wanted to convince your son to make a different choice, one that you approve of so that you can feel good, or even any time you notice his weight, maybe before you see his shine, if you could actually visualize that what you are doing is handing him more weight in the form of heaviness of your own feelings. And that should most certainly be a catalyst for you to do some shifting and inner work and get to a place of focusing on your sunshine, as I showed you I did with my Jacob. And on the flip side of that, and this actually is the visual you should be going to as often as possible, uh, for those times when you do successfully shift your mindset and your energy and you are with your child in a place of, you know, pure celebration of who he is, Wow, envision that weight being removed from your beingness and floating right out the window. That is so awesome. And then be glad for the fact that you chose to hand your son joy and love and you protected your son's inner peace and you gave him a safe place to feel good about himself and to grow from that place and then move forward with him in that energy. Um, another tool is a book I've been talking about for years, a book we've mentioned a lot on this podcast. It's called Kids, Carrots, and Candy, a Practical, Positive Approach to Raising Children Free of Food and Weight Problems. And that's a good book for you to read, too. All right, so I want to just move my lantern over here a little bit <laughs> because I want to talk a little bit about the whole concept of releasing parental controls uh, just so you can check in with your energy on this one also. Um, radical unschooling to me and my family has honestly never been about releasing parental controls because I came into motherhood so fascinated by my children and the way their minds worked. I kind of came into motherhood as an empty vessel wanting to learn from my children and have them show me the way they see the world. And yes, while some automatic reactions come up from my childhood um, around food and other things, I still always looked to my children and I had so much faith and trust in them. I knew that with every choice they made, that they had a good point about why they were making that choice. I saw the world through their eyes and I understood their choices and I let them know that they were expanding my world and changing my old thought patterns with their choices just by following what felt good and right to them. And so for us, as I said, there were never parental controls to release. There was always respect and conversations and wonder and questions and research and more conversations and more conversations. Above all else, my lantern was always right there on my shining children. They, that was my focus. And for every step of our lives together, it was my goal to make sure they felt good about themselves. And so I created a safe environment for them where they knew for sure that they and their choices were validated, respected, honored, and celebrated. 
we kind of always trusted each other. And to this, uh, this to us, this is radical unschooling. So the thing about the thinking that unschooling is about releasing parental controls is this. I feel like there's really no release at all as long as the parent believes they have the power to release a control. Because with that power, there's still a clear hierarchy that says, I'm the parent and I say yes or no. So, you know, in our family, as I said, everything's a discussion. Everything came from us as equals um, and talking all the time. And when there's a parent-child hierarchy, uh, you don't have that. And the thing that keeps that line drawn between parent and child even more is when that alleged release of parent control comes with strings attached. When the parent says, yes, you can do whatever you want now and yet stands by with disapproval and expectations and subtle coerciveness to get the child to do what the parent will approve of. And those things, disapproval, expectations, and coercing, really should not be a part of a radical unschooling life. And only for the reason that with those things, a child cannot be truly free to explore the world or truly free to learn about themselves and what makes them feel good and what does not. They're not truly free to wonder and learn and grow. Because with any judgment, disapproval, or expectation, a child's safe place just does not exist. And so the child's choices are then in response to that judgment, disapproval, and those expectations, instead of his choices coming from that sacred, perfect place of who he is. Okay, so you might have noticed that all these things I've held the lantern over to illuminate have this common thread of focus on the child's shine and glorious beingness. And you might also notice that while all those things we looked at had that swirling common thread. They were nowhere near your original questions. And that's because what you were focusing on, what you were asking about, was not really about how to accept, honor, and celebrate your child for being exactly who he is. And I really feel that's all we need to illuminate right there. I was holding my lanterns on the places that will help you see past what is merely the surface of your child and allow you to instead see the depth of his light and his shine and his perfect beingness. So your questions will naturally fade away as you focus on that light that is your child's shine. In fact, here are some other questions that you can ask of yourself every day. How can I connect with my son today in a place of sheer joy, accepting, honoring, and celebrating all that he is and all that he loves? How can I best serve him and be his friend, his mother, who loves him unconditionally for being exactly who he is? How can I create a sacred, safe space for him to discover his own path and become who he is meant to be? And what can I bring to his life today that will allow him to shine even brighter? Those are some good questions, and I believe that's really where you want to be holding your lantern. Pam? <laughs> that was awesome. And I really do love your lantern idea. Um, mm -hmm. And I would like to hold my lantern on how you phrased your question, Kelly. And by the way, I'm glad you enjoyed the podcast. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I loved your question, and I'm really enjoying digging into it and uh, listening to what Anne has been saying. But anyway, um, if we look at your question and how you phrased it, so just uh, to refresh, how can I best support my son to one, consider how eating affects our ability to engage in physical activities we enjoy, and two, that conditioning will help him to take on big taxing activities like biking for five days straight. So the challenge that I see with, is that this question is at odds with itself. Because you're asking how to support your son, which is like a bottom-up thing. Support is about helping someone do what they want to do. But what you want him to do is listen to you when you tell him that his eating is affecting his physical fitness and that he should get in shape for his bike trip. So, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too, as it were. You can do one thing or the other. You can try to make him listen to you and do what you say. Or you can help him do what he wants to do. 
And I mean, it's understandable that we want to phrase it that right way, right? Because we want them to listen to us and we want them to do it on our timetable, but we also don't want to judge, shame, coerce, you know, demand things of them, but something's got to give. So when I noticed that I had put myself in that spot over the years, in the end, I would decide every time that I wasn't willing to insist that they listen to me because that would um, cause too much damage to our connection, trust and relationship. And that whole piece that Anne mentioned about um, us putting our layer on top of them so that for them to even have a have a chance of understanding themselves and make free choices, they would have to work through all that layer of expectation and judgment that I was putting on top of them. So first I do the work to release my need to be right and for them to listen to me right now. And what I've learned having done this so many times is that it so often turns out that my way was truly not the only way and that my timetable was just that, mine. The world didn't end if things took longer or things looked different at all. So maybe this bike trip will be the thing that sparks some revelations around this for him. Or maybe he'll go, he'll be winded and challenged and tired and not be embarrassed or worried about it. Maybe he won't change a thing and he'll go on the bike trip and have fun. Maybe it won't be an issue at all. So don't assume that you know how his experience will go. So if you choose to drop that piece, what can you do? Well, you can think of his enjoyment of the bike trip. Um, you think that his enjoyment of the bike trip might be dependent on his conditioning. And you said that you've tried casual conversation about it. Yet what you can actively do is support the physical activities that he enjoys. So that's the support piece, the celebrating him piece, helping him do what he wants to do. So don't just wait for him to ask you. Um, take the lead more often, offering up those physical activities that you said he likes. Bring out the play swords earlier in the day and ask him to play with you. Invite him out on the trampoline with you and go. Uh, pull out a bike or the bike ramps. You know, you've said those are the things that he really enjoys that are physical. Um, he doesn't have a lot of people uh, to play with uh, his age. Do those things with. You enjoy doing them with him. Uh, make Offer those things up. Um, but then uh, the other thing you can do with the food, you mentioned that he likes fruit and meat and protein along with um, his all the sweets and stuff stuff those choices so you can make sure that they're available and accessible for him at night so that he has lots of choices to make and then realize that those truly are his choices to make no judgment there's no need to bring up those things again that you've already told him about food and activity and conditioning just like you say you know that he's heard them because he's uh, shutting you off saying you know okay I've heard that I've heard that so instead, just do things to support him. Up those food options so that he knows they're there. Uh, bring physical opportunities, things that you know he enjoys. And then just be around for general conversations to flow so that he can bring these things up in conversation when he's interested in talking about them and when he may be ready to listen to any experience that you have to share. And the most important piece is as long as it doesn't feel manipulative to him. So there are things you can do to support him in these areas, but they cannot be done with the expectation that he will specifically learn what you want him to learn, nor that he will do it on your timetable, in this case, before the bike trip. Because if you approach it that way, he truly will, as Anne explained, feel that energy as manipulation and resist it and feel it as judgment. And then that just puts that whole layer of weight on top of it all that makes it so hard to move forward. And and that's where they can get stuck in places longer. When we're bringing that expectation energy, so often our kids get stuck in places longer than they naturally would have because that's extra weight for them to work through, to move through the situation. Anything to add, Anna? Well, I feel like you guys <laughs> covered so much and I kind of want to, I kind of want to sit there. So I'm just going to say that maybe just like two things, because basically 
reiterating what Pam said is that what I've learned along the way is that I really truly do not know what's best for someone else. You know, I have my ideas, I have a best guess, but in the end, I really don't know. So like you said, he may struggle at camp, he might not. But my kind of litmus test is that my priority is always the relationship. So are my actions helping or hurting the relationship? Because he can sense your energy around this even when things go unspoken. And I think I just want to leave it there because I feel like Anne covered so much of how to just really look at him and see his shine and engage with him. And Pam gave you, you know, those few specifics, too. So I just want to leave it there because I feel like so much it was so beautiful what was covered. Yeah. So I, I want to leave it there. <laughs> yeah, uh, can I just add one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just want to leave it with the words, you know, radical acceptance yeah. because... Um, it, it is so important to look past your preconceived definitions of how he should be and radical acceptance and celebration of who he is right now is really, really crucial. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to move on to question two, which is from Claire, who is in the UK. So hello, Claire. So her question. Hi there. My question is a bit of a selfish one to be truthful, but here goes. I am exhausted at the end of the day as two of my children, both boys, are very dependent upon me to entertain them. One is 10 years old and the other is four years old. I have a nine-year-old too, but he happily amuses himself on his various devices. I feel I let them go to their gaming consoles, consoles all day so that I can have some peace. I'm just so tired. If I don't play with them, they are constantly saying they are bored. How do I manage it all? Playing with them, cleaning, general housework. I'm just so tired. I am not sure what my question is really. I'm just struggling to entertain my boys so they are not bored all the time. Crafts, they are not interested in at all or reading. It is constant action. Parks where I don't sit down on the bench at the park, but play with them, football, shooting games, or imaginative play. They can't seem to play without me. It's lovely, but I'm so tired and I'm fine. I am a hundred miles an hour most days. Any advice? So hello, Claire, and thank you for the question. Um, I think I would probably start with maybe reframing or looking at the board concept because I think it can feel to the parent like it's something to be instantly solved or that it's somehow a criticism of the life that they have or you as a parent. And I don't think we have to look at it that way. I feel like it's an expression of where they are at that moment and that from boredom can come a spark to try something new. And that's not to say at all to ignore your boys or this expression, but to watch if you're being triggered by it. So just kind of check in with that. I loved, loved, loved reading about your engagement with them. It's so beautiful. And the lovely connection is so evident that they have with you. I think you will find your need as a playmate will kind of ebb and flow through the years. But it, and it's also important to care for yourself during those higher need times. But also for me, it was just to kind of enjoy the ride of those times because it honestly goes so fast. Um, you know, practically, there were times when we did make lists of things that we love to do and things that we wanted to try. And we were in kind of this lull or in between moment where nobody knew what they where they wanted to go. We would check the list. And it wasn't like we always did something from the list or checked it off, but it got us thinking and talking and a conversation started. And usually it would just kind of send us off in a new direction. Um, I was always honest with my girls when I didn't have it in me anymore. Um, at that point, we would look for ways that we could connect that worked for all of us. Or sometimes we would just take space and then regroup. But I feel like that type of honest communication and working together is a big part of living in relationship with other people. So hearing me communicate my needs really helps them do the same. So, I, you know, that's part of that being in a family. So I think those are maybe important things to kind of consider and think about, you know, are you, you know, there, I get a sense of like kind of this martyrdom, but it's like, I think if you talk about it, and Anne mentioned this too, this partnership, this talking, this communication, this back and forth, you know, that really is the best way to get everyone's needs met. So anyway, I'm going to leave it there. And Anne, anything to add? <laughs> 
well. Um, we I use the same language in writing my notes that you just used, and <laughs> I I'm going gonna, gonna to go ahead and speak yeah, go ahead. as if you did not say everything that I'm going to say. Okay. <laughs> but I start out saying, in our family, I always describe our days as ebb and flow. <laughs> <laughs> and with ebb and flow, you follow your own rhythm, doing your own things. And um, then uh, there comes a time when we would come together after we were doing our own things for a while. And so, okay, maybe my boys would be off um, playing together or Jacob would be drawing. Sam would be off playing with the swords while I did my thing. Then I would make the decision to go to them and be with them after a while and be genuinely interested in what they were doing. I'd ask them if they wanted something to do something with me or they want a snack or lunch or I'd bring food to them. Um, I'd listen to them and their stories of their games. And just sometimes we'd talk about exciting plans we have coming up. Maybe I'd share something interesting I discovered. The, the whole day is so full of possibilities when you allow everyone to feel their flow. And I think that's what Anna's saying about labeling them as being bored. Um, it just might need a little stimulation to follow to for them to get in touch again with their flow if they are go, going through a growing phase and they've outgrown, you know, everything that they've done or they're done with it. Uh, then that's just time to take a new direction in sometimes the easiest way to take a new direction seriously you get in the car and you take a new road that you've never taken before <laughs> um possibilities come up in so so many ways when you uh just listen within and let things flow and maybe not try to um be there so much to fix things when there's nothing really to be fixed um there, there's so much more in between the spectrum of you leaving them alone to their gaming all day and you feeling the need to entertain them all day. And I guess that's my point. And I think something else I want to share with you is that it's not selfish for you to take care of yourself either. Um, I hear that you're tired. The tiring thing doesn't really go away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my kids are 27 and 23, and I'm still really tired, but it's because of all the jobs I have from learning who I am from living with them. So, you know, it's a beautiful flow to it throughout all of these years. But we also don't need to make a choice of either being with our kids or taking care of ourselves. You know, we can honor their needs and desires while honoring our own. Um, just little ways you can find things that are fulfilling to you instead of exhausting. Because I, I find when I'm doing something that comes from totally within me, it, you know, rejuvenates me. It's uh, part of my enthusiasm. And that just makes me feel up and awake and light and free. So if you can, you know, add pieces of that into your playtime with your kids or whatever, that would be great. And I also had down, let them know when you are tired because they get tired. They need to see uh, living unschooling is living an authentic life with each other. And um, you can say, I'm really tired. We just played all that. I'm going to sit here and read this book or knit. You guys want to be by me while I do that or, you know, anything like that. It's not like you have to break off the connection entirely, but just... Again, do what you can to encourage everybody listening to within themselves and going with their own flow, the ebb and flow. And I also, similar to what Anna said, I was thinking maybe you can start having conversations about what, what your upcoming days can look like. And everyone can talk about what they want to do. You can explore possibilities and lay them all out. And you can share what you would like to do. It's not just about your boys. If they feel um, excitement in you, they might want to do it too. And you know, insert some really cool things in the conversations that they would really look forward to. And uh, you could have this conversation be a blueprint for a day of ebbing and flowing and then see where it takes you. It's never anything written in stone. It's always just seeing where it takes you when you're following what is inside of you and where it all flows. It's all ideas and inspiration that come to you and then you just follow where it takes you. Pam, anything to add? 
Well, I would say, hi, Claire, and uh, I loved reading about how actively you're playing games with your uh, sons. And that said, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed, that's definitely something to take the time to look at and see what's up. So I just thought I would touch on a couple of things that you mentioned that you might want to think about. So you said that you let them go on their gaming consoles all day so that you can have some peace. So some questions you might ask yourself, are they happy with that time on their console? So may, maybe can you shift your thinking around that choice from I let them to they want to? If they're saying they're bored while playing, is it because they're hitting challenges that they can't overcome? Uh, could you support their gaming by playing by helping them find walkthroughs or tips for getting unstuck in their game? So this is less physical work, but maybe it would be a nice change of pace for you. And as for the physical play, um, you can try brainstorm ways to help them get as much as they want with you not always being as directly involved. Like uh, they were, Anna and Anna were saying, you know, uh, bringing up your needs and wants as well. So um, maybe they want to play something more formally, like a kids football league. Sometimes I know I would, just for ideas, you know, I, I had the list too that Anna talked about that when we were looking for something new, we might we might look through more for sparking ideas rather than, oh, for then choosing something that's on it. I would also look through the local recreation calendar when it showed up and just see what was up around us um, and mention something that if I saw anything that I thought they might like. Um, you might also ask around, see if there's a teen, uh, you might be able to pay to come around and play physical games with them, maybe once or twice a week for a few hours, just a, uh, different dynamic for them as well. And also I just wanted to touch on diving a bit deeper into that idea of boredom, uh, because it isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's part of learning more about ourselves. Uh, when we don't have something immediately on our plate, we have time to think about what might interest us. Uh, maybe they're look when they say they're bored, they're looking more for connection rather than a particular activity. Um, because you don't need to think of, well, at least I don't think of the opposite of boredom as being busy. You know what I mean? Boredom mm -hmm. isn't a problem to solve so much as it's just a feeling that we're experiencing. So instead, when they say they're bored, maybe just try being with them, validating their feelings, connecting with them, rather than trying to fix it quickly. As uh, I think Anne was saying, you know, this isn't something that you need to jump in and, and fix for them immediately. And Karen James wrote a really neat bit about boredom and how she approaches it with her son, and I will link to that in the show notes. Okay, question number three is from Jen in Florida. She writes, Hi, Pam, Ann, and Anna. I've been listening to your podcast for about six months now. When my son was an infant, I took him to a parent and baby class. The parent education was very helpful and started me down the path of being respectful and responsive. But the child-centered portion was so ridiculous, trying to teach infants, even to the point of stopping them from open-ended exploration of the material. From there, I realized he was in for many years of that unless we unschool him, of course. I have had and still have a lot of de-schooling to do, but already there is so much more joy in our interactions and so much deeper communication between us. I couldn't have imagined that a 20-month-old could communicate so many of his needs and wishes and even understand and voluntarily respect my personal boundaries. Already it's fascinating to see his interests develop and weave together and to grow myself as I stretch to find the excitement in things that totally don't excite me but that he loves like motorcycles. After spending months sort of unintentionally being dismissive toward this interest and sort of giving it as little attention as possible, hoping it would go away, the first time I jumped in and actively pointed out a motorcycle he hadn't noticed, he gave me a smile like the brightest sun. I'm mostly writing because I know you get lots of questions about screen time, and so I thought this might be of interest. I grew up with a very tightly controlled screen access and thought during pregnancy that we would literally do no screens until two years old, as recommended by the AAP. Well, we ended up introducing videos in the car because it was the only thing that would keep him happy when someone couldn't sit next to him in the back. And then we used the phone to show him some photos of himself and long-distance relatives. And then we used YouTube to show him videos related to other interests, like real life trains and animal sounds. And pretty soon he was actively asking to watch videos. 
For months, I would try everything to distract him from watching a video and end up giving in when he would cry because I wasn't letting him. I didn't like that battle for control, so after many episodes of this podcast, I took a deep breath and decided to give it a few months of letting him watch as much as he wanted and trying to suspend my fears. I started offering more options to watch, things he wouldn't know exist to ask for, and he started selecting videos based on what thumbnail looked interesting to him. When my fears crept back in, I would return to sports casting and guessing aloud what it might be that he liked about a certain video. Through this process, his vocabulary has grown, so he can now ask me to search for videos on an even broader range of interests. Now I can see how excited he gets when he finds a video he likes and he points and calls out the exciting things he sees. And then when we are out or in other play, I see his excitement and pride in himself when he can name or recognize something he learned from watching a video. There is so much joy in our interactions and in all the relationships in our family. This is my very long-winded way of saying thank you, thank you, thank you for all your work and for helping me see my little boy blossoming. And lastly, a request. I would love if you could have an episode sometime talking about applying unschooling to very young kids. Since he isn't able to have a full conversation yet or verbalize complex ideas and feelings, finding ways to meet both our needs or to creatively let him explore without letting him be unsafe, like running out into the street, for example, as well as support him when he has strong feelings that he doesn't know how to express, feels pretty one-sided, as in it's mostly me talking and he really he can't really help find solutions, though he does sometimes give a yes or no about whether something I suggest works for him. I try to approach everything with patience, creativity, and to start with naming what I see before trying to solve anything, but I would really love some more ideas and perspectives from more experienced unschoolers about what it looks like to apply these principles with very young children. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much, Jen, for sharing that. I really wanted to share um, your snapshot of your journey so far. I think it was really fun and interesting to read, and I'm happy to share it with everyone. Now, in my experience, uh, when I eventually heard the term attachment parenting, I realized it was the closest parenting style description I'd come across that aligned with my style, though I didn't discover homeschooling or unschooling until my eldest was nine. So the same kind of ideas you express. And I wrote a blog post a few years ago about, uh, about how attachment parenting flows into unschooling, and you might find that interesting. So I'll put that in the show notes. But really, I think it's a personal thing. Sometimes it helps to think about our time with our young children as parenting, as mothering without any additional pressure. Whereas for others, it helps to start seeing things through the lens of unschooling if that's the education lifestyle that we're planning on when our child reaches school age. Especially if you're feeling overwhelmed by mainstream messages to get them learning academics early. You know, uh, that control piece comes earlier and earlier nowadays. So yes, when they're young, we are actively their extra set of hands to help them do things and to keep them safe while nurturing our connection with them and watching them for clues about their needs and intentions and their more direct communication skills will grow over time. Um, if you'd like to connect with others in similar circumstances, I know Unschooling Mom to Mom has an early childhood Facebook group and I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. But I do think if you just focus on meeting his needs in the ways that work for him, that connection and that secure attachment de that's developing is the most important thing. As he gets older, it's from that strong foundation that he'll become more interested in exploring the world. And that connection is what will help him feel safe to express his feelings and desires as he becomes more able. So it sounds like uh, you've got, got a great focus and a great relationship developing with him. Anna? I'm just laughing because you'll see as I think through this question, we really are in separate states and countries even as we create these answers and they're all so similar because we just have the same kind of feeling. So I just love that. Um, you know, to me, the principles are really the same because I'm coming back to who do I want to be in this interaction and I want to choose being someone who's kind and connected, um, just with little ones, things to, you know, distraction can certainly be a tool. And it, I laughed about this because um, my friend Pat and I, we call it the toddler rule and we actually use it for pe people of all ages. And it's basically having something to move towards instead of saying, we don't like this or you can't do that. So I think that's helpful, that idea of moving towards something when you get in a conflict. Um, 
But as you've noticed, uh, you know, even very young children are quite capable of communicating their needs. And they are so very excited and appreciative when they hear that, that when we hear them and understand what they're communicating. So I think staying present in the moment, connecting and communicating in all of its forms is just really what's happening at that age. You know, with the road as an example, instead of just removing our kids from the road, we would talk about what was going on, what we were listening and watching and how we were making our decisions and where we could walk and where we could stand and what I was observing. And that gave them more information than just the stop or don't, you know, that you would hear people do. And it helped them start to read the situations for themselves. And I feel like it made them safer because you know, I'm not always there and they're learning how to read the situation. And we would walk often in our neighborhood. And when they were very little, they would be calling out car side of the road (laughs) because we would talk about when we're listening for the cars, the cars are coming, we get to the side. And so very early on, they started that. So they were getting those tools. So that's something I love about these relationships when they're young is that giving information versus just this top down, I'm deciding for you. And there were certainly times where I had to say stop, but it was followed by connecting and making observations and sharing observations. And it was so rare for such a strong directive to be coming from me that they they would stop in their tracks and uh, try to figure out what was going on. So that was part of the trust that we developed. Um, I just think halt is another important thing at this age, and that's that hungry, angry, lonely, tired tool. Um, We found when things were tough, it was usually hungry or tired for us. And so it's just a good quick reminder to see if we're having any kind of issues, you know, what about a snack or have we gotten the sleep that we need or is it time for a nap or that type of thing. So it's a helpful tool. Um, Go bags filled with fun toys and activities helped make visits and appointments easier. Those were things that we used when they were younger to just help connect and, and move through those moments. But really what I love about your question is that you're doing it, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. The connections you're making now will just keep growing. And the tools that you all are developing together will both be there as you both grow older and more connected. And then unschooling will just naturally blossom from that foundation. So I think it's really cool. And I I loved reading your story. So thank you so much for sending it in. Anne? Uh, Hi, Jen. Um, I just had the biggest smile on my face (laughs) while reading your words and just imagining the two of you. And I'm going to come to Florida now and hang out with the two of you (laughs) because I just love your energy. And I thank you so much for the gift of your so-called question, but also your um, story that you shared with us. Um, And yeah, yeah, you're doing pretty well following your instinct and his joy. And um, I would suggest you go listen to the story from my new friend, Jen in Florida, who talked about her son and his videos. (laughs) (laughs) And just keep, I mean, look what you learned uh, with that, that, uh, you know, uh, just following the child's joy opens paths and possibilities that, Uh, we could very well shut down with our preconceived definitions and uh, judgment. And yet when you leave it open, uh, look what the child can do. I mean, that's the thing to just allow the child to take you into wonderful places. And, and the thing about uh, crossing the street or running the road, everybody like has uses that for like a a big fear (laughs) of their child. And uh, one thing is my kids never want to be hurt. And so (laughs) they don't do things that are dangerous for them. And uh, second of all, when they're really little, we kind of just had like a secret fun handshake that we would do when we're crossing the street. So it's like a little fun game where they would grab hold my hand and it was kind of our special thing that we did uh, whenever we crossed the street. So they would seek that out. And again, it got to the point where my boys were older and we're in New York City and they're like grabbing me by the back of the shirt because I'm walking out in front of the traffic. So <laughs> <laughs> so life is like that and it's wonderful. And I think you're awesome. And thank you so much for sharing your story and your your family with us. Okay, I guess we are on to question four, right? Yeah. That is from Stacy in Idaho. 
And she writes, Dear Unschooling Mamas, I love this podcast, Pam. My favorite part is the Q&A with you, Anna, and Anne. You all inspire me to be the kind of mama that I know I can be. You are so, also positive and filled with joy. Sometimes I am not. Some days I am grumpy, tuned out, and long to live on a desert island far away from my family. Will you please talk about the hard days, the days you don't want to be creative and joyful, the days you want no one to ask you for anything? I know you have grown children and the demands for your time and attention now have shifted, but please tell me about your days when you felt like this. Thank you so much for the good work you are doing. I honestly feel like you are three of my newest best friends. So much love and gratitude, Stacy. Hi, Stacy. <laughs> First of all, you're adorable. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm blushing here. Are, are, are you guys blushing? <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's kind of funny how many people think Pam and Anna and I do not have challenging times in our lives. <laughs> um, we are human and life happens and we have all gone through or are currently going through very challenging times. And I certainly don't want to speak for my friends, but the three of us do have this conversation amongst ourselves often. Yeah. Most recently was just yeah. a couple of days ago, in fact. <laughs> Uh, So I believe I can safely speak for all of us when I just say that um, what you see in us is our deliberate choice to not allow the challenging times to define our lives, not even for a day. Uh, Yeah, we may have grumpy moments and have difficulties and we've had tragedies happen and we have emotions and everything else that everyone experiences. And yet we know for sure that these things do not have the power to define us nor decide for us what kind of day we're having. And that's exactly the reason why I do not ever say I am having a bad day or something I am grumpy today. Challenges, emotions, feeling grumpy or tired or not creative. These are temporary things that do not in my world consume nor define an entire day. How I feel at any given moment is my choice. So it all comes down to how I want to feel. So what does my life feel and look like when I'm feeling grumpy? It feels like I'm stuck under a lot of weight. Uh, uh, Coming from that place of misery, everything else I see takes on that same hue of grumpiness. My dogs, my husband, my jobs, the things I need to do for the day. Everything seems to turn into work that I don't want to do. I complain, and a black cloud follows me around, blocking out any light. And none of that feels good to me. So in the vast spectrum of choices in front of me as to how I want to feel, grumpy's just not in there. So nor is holding on to any negative feelings for very long because it all feels the same and it all produces the same result. It blocks the light of who I really am. I talk about this extensively in our Childhood Redefined Summit uh, because it really is something that people want to explore and learn about and have a tool to um, shift themselves. So a little summary here for you is this. Um, My life has proven time and time again that when I deliberately choose to feel good, then I'm in receiving mode for uh, all of the goodness and inspiration and light that is coming to me it's on its way to me right now and there are a zillion subcategories of reasons why I deliberately choose to feel good as well and one of them is my relationship with my husband and my family I know where I want to be at the end of the day and that's simply feeling good not feeling bad and I don't want to hand anyone else the weight that my grumpiness carries, as I was talking about in uh, the first question. I don't want to make them feel bad by handing them my stuff, the weight of my baggage. I want my family to know that they're valuable in my life and I see their light and I appreciate and celebrate them. And honestly, when I'm a little bit grumpy, I look around. Oh, cue Hamilton song, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> look around and I think you know I, I just can't stay in a grumpy place when I am surrounded by so much goodness so yeah and again in any given day right this very moment in fact I'm going through some challenging things 
And yet, why would I want to use that as a label for my day or my life? Why would I want to allow those challenges to make me feel bad when feeling good is a choice? And I honestly can get there instantly by choosing it. I also trust that any challenge I face is here to allow me to expand and learn and grow. Challenges are here so that I get to fine tune who I am and who I want to be. And I am always more of my best self for having learned how to walk through a difficulty without letting it define who I am. So again, summary, feeling bad feels bad. Grumpy happens, but it doesn't take us anywhere good. (laughs) (laughs) Feeling good feels good. And I do all I can to deliberately choose the latter. And I remind myself that I am light and I do what I can to let that light shine. Yo, Pam. Yo, yo. <laughs> I, I Just a couple things I wanted to, to pick up there. Um, the first piece was or is that, that that choice, you know, when you notice that you're grumpy, why I would learn to make the choice to move through it, to, to recognize it, you know, um, and see it, but choose to move through it is because I knew from experience that when I got stuck there, things just got worse, spiraled down and spiraled down. And like you were talking about that hue, everything takes on that hue. And then I start spreading it around and making everybody more miserable, you know? So that realization, knowing that I would actually make better choices myself and for my life and for, you know, everything that was going to happen in our day, um, when I chose to, uh, find a way to move through it. Right. So that was a huge piece for me. And as, uh, came up in a, an earlier question, um, it's okay to, to want a quieter day, to need a quieter day. That's about our relationship and, and our communication as a family. Um, even when my kids were young, they'd want me to help help feel help me feel better if I was you know tired or cranky or whatever I could say I'm not up for that today can we do this instead or whatever you know that it it's also helpful for them to realize that you can recognize those moments and and make choices right that you still have choices that these things aren't just happening to you um you know we are free to make choices in every moment Um, The other thing I do is pay attention to any pattern. So if I notice that this was happening to me more regularly, I'd work to dig. I'd I'd think, you know, there's something going on that keeps um, knocking at my door, as it were. Right. And it would be worth the time to dig in and see what's see what's going on. Um, And instead of reading them to you, I just I'm going to share in the show notes a couple of blog posts that I wrote that I think might be relevant. Um, One is called Finding Joy, which is about some of the bigger mind shifts on my unschooling journey that helped me find joy more often. Because, yeah, there's always stuff going on. Uh, And the other one is a positive outlook isn't turning a blind eye. So, yes, living joyfully doesn't mean life is without challenges. It's not about ignoring those challenges, stuffing them down, saying, oh, geez, I shouldn't feel that, or this shouldn't be happening, um, like they're not under your control. It's about how, ways to walk through them. So, oh, oh, and there's there's another one called Mindfulness and Unschooling. That, that might be helpful as well. I'll link to that one. Um, I think that that's just the biggest point is, is it's not a day, you know, bad days, hard days. They're moments, right, to realize that because when you think of it as a day, you're just looking for more bad stuff to happen, right? It's, it, it really does affect our whole outlook, our whole perspective. So to take that moment, accept that moment, um, but seeing the good stuff, walking towards the good stuff, making choices, knowing I still have choices, all that kind of stuff was really helpful. Anna? Yeah, so here we go again. <laughs> but um, but as Ann mentioned, this is something that we get a lot. You know, we this yeah. is a question that we get a lot. And so I do think it's important to hear again kind of why we all are making these choices that we do. You know, for me, the tools that I use did depend on the environment and also the ages. I definitely can take more time to myself now. That wasn't really an option for me when they were little. Um, but I would look for the little things. For me, it was touching the earth, being around trees, just being outside 
could help ground me and recenter me. Um, gratitude is also a biggie. You know, when chaos is swirling around me in any kind of form, I can look around for anything that sparks a smile or joy. Uh-huh. And that can be my comfortable bed at the end of the day. That can be when the sun hits the room in a certain way, a bird that's posing outside my window, you know, and things about my children, their laugh, the, their smile, the turn of their ear, anything that brings me back to what I love about this life, because there's so much. And when I use gratitude to shift my energy, I can turn my difficult day around very quickly. So I try to look at it just like they said, as difficult moments and that with each each new moment is a chance to turn it around. And that just feels easier to me. That feels doesn't feel insurmountable. Difficult days, difficult time, I'm going through a hard time, feels so heavy and insurmountable. But knowing that each moment I get to choose how I feel and that I can turn it around, that feels easy. And it does, even in what are very can be difficult times. So oh. I leave it at that. I'd like to add one other thing, a tool that I have shared with others who, and they've really appreciated it, that I've been using for a long time is um, I, whatever comes in front of me that um, is beautiful or anything that's unique or anything, I call it a gift just for me from the universe. So, Mm -hmm. and when you start opening your eyes to anything that is in front of you, um, that surprises you, that takes your breath away. A bird, as Anna was saying, that's what reminded me about this. Mm -hmm. Because right when you said that, my bluebird flew by. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the bluebird flew by. And I, I, you know, I would guess, and I say, thank you. Thank you for that gift just for me. You know, I see a pattern in the sky. Oh, look at that. Thank you for that gift just for me. I drive down the driveway and I see all of our apple trees blossoming. And wow, wow, what a gift just for me. And you, there's, there's, it shifts immediately because you, you can't even begin to name all of the gifts that are in front of you just for you. Um, but when you do start naming the ones that you really notice, it just makes a huge impact and makes the shift easy also. Yes, yes. And I'm going to jump in with one more tool that I thought of while you guys were chatting. Um, For me, too, a big thing, and I think we talked about this earlier this week, is when I'm feeling overwhelmed by a lot of things, is to not, is to realize that and to not keep overwhelming myself. Mm -hmm. A big list of the million and one things that I feel like are on my plate that I want to do something with, but instead to just look what's right here in front of me in this Mm -hmm. moment, you know, these couple of things that I can do today, that I want to do today. And when I can focus on that, um, you know, especially when, when you've got younger kids around, right, I can focus on these couple of things that I can do with them. All the other things that I'm feeling weighed about, um, they exist, but there's nothing I can do uh, about them right in this moment that's a bigger picture thing a longer term thing um but right now um when it's feeling overwhelming i can look down instead of looking up at all of it and focus on this moment and what happens is i find the joy in that moment in doing that one little thing with my child and um that builds up my strength and and my excitement and um and I also end up actually accomplishing one of those little things that was on my plate, right? And it's like, oh, I can still move forward with this weight. I just don't need to notice it, you know, all at once. Mm -hmm. I can just focus on what's in front of me today and and work on that. And it's a way to get through so much when things are, are feeling overwhelming. And that is the last question for this month. I want to thank you guys both so much for answering questions with me. I love it so much. It's a great uh, moment of the month to hang out with you guys. Thank and, you so much. Thank you. And just a reminder that there are links in the show notes for the things that we've mentioned in the episode. And as always, if you'd like to submit a question for the Q&A show, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. 
Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the Tuck Talks. For six years, I hosted the Toronto Unschooling Conference. It was an amazing experience and I loved meeting many wonderful unschooling families. Though I no longer host the conference, the unschooling insights shared by the amazing speakers over the years are timeless. You can listen to all 25 talks for free on my website at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash conference. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.